Um, ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker for the evening is again, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to have the chance to introduce him uh, for many reasons. First of all, as I said, given the sustained interest that the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy has in the field of sports as cultural diplomacy. Secondly, someone really with as extensive a career as actually Mr. William Gaillard. Allow me to say a few words about his background. Uh, Mr. Gaillard initially was educated, uh, amongst other institutions, at Sciences Po Paris, where I also had the chance to study for a year, a uh, very, uh, very impressive institution, uh, the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Harvard University as well, and uh, Mr. Gaillard has had a multifaceted career in both the public as well as the private sector. I don't have time to actually mention everything that he's done, but I want to mention at least some of the highlights, because it's really a, a very distinctive and an impressive career. In 1978, Mr. Gaillard served as head of media relations for the European Commission in Washington. In 1983, he served as chief of external relations, multinational force and observers uh, for the United Nations, based in Rome. Uh, 1985, head of external relations for the UNRWA in Vienna. In 1990, director of communication and political affairs for the UN International Drug Control Program, also based in Vienna. 1994, Director of Corporate Communications for the International Air Transport Association. 2004, Director of Communications and Public Affairs for UEFA, where he currently is. Starting in 2009, Senior Advisor to the President of UEFA. Now, among his responsibilities, uh, Mr. Gaillard advises the UEFA presidents on political matters and oversees all activities relating to the external communications. This includes international media relations with the European government authorities, as well as UEFA's social responsibility and charity programs. So again, somebody who really knows the field of sports and communications from the inside and out. So we're very much looking forward to your keynote address uh, and to learning from you in terms of the impact and the potential that actually sports has to transcend borders uh, in ways that sometimes politics and economics cannot. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Mr. William Gaillard. Thank you. tonight. Um, I'm sure for you it's an unusual topic, so we'll try to combine the two uh, and uh, uh, try to make an impact uh, among ourselves on the issue of sports and the way it relates uh, to the historical uh, developments uh, between nations. There is, of course, a very uh, ambiguous uh, relationship between uh, football uh, and, and Europe. It's an ambiguity that goes back to the idea of territory, boundaries, and, and ethnic groups. And I hope you will forgive me if I go back a little bit uh, in history in order to trace uh, that, uh, that relationship. Football is, is very much like uh, jazz. Uh, or, or cinema, a function of uh, modernity. It is also uh, a cultural expression uh, in Europe of the working classes. I think the social origins of, of football um, are very clear, both uh, in the UK and uh, on the continent. The growth of football is also closely linked to the principle of nationalities and the idea of, of self-determination. At the same time, Europe is essentially uh, a postmodern concept, as opposed to football, which is very much of a modern uh, idea. And it's a postmodern concept that is expressed essentially uh, by an elite. And it is increasingly linked to uh, the idea of globalization and uh, the dominance of, uh, of market forces, and in particular, uh, financial capitalism. So the 19th century, where it all began, is, as you know, uh, the century of the nationalities, the century also uh, of nationalism. And if we go back to uh, the theoreticians, of, of nationalism uh, at that time, uh, be they uh, Herder, uh, Fichte, or, or, or Renan uh, 
in France, when they define what constitutes a people, they look at many cultural factors. For them, what defines a people is language, folk tales, and, and music. Of course, the ground and, and the blood, uh, Boden and Blut in, in Germany, also the dead, but also, and especially for Renan, uh, the will to live together. By the late 19th century and early 20th century, sports become an element of that uh, identity. Football uh, is one, but earlier you have gymnastics. In the German-speaking countries, the, the Turnen, or even in, in, in the Czech land, uh, the Sokol, that structure uh, national identity around uh, physical exercise. I believe that uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is, is a great uh, open lab for trying out uh, concepts related to uh, sports and, and nationalities. Because uh, it embodied uh, a mix of, of nationalities, of ethnic groups, of language groups, it was a strange mixture of some, so, sometimes social and economic backwardness, but at the same time, uh, in the arts and literature, uh, very interesting avant-garde. And also this uh, strange uh, combination of, of bigotism and, and tolerance. And in many ways, football anticipated uh, the breakup of the great dynastic uh, empires uh, at the end of World War I. Why I will use examples from Austria-Hungary, it is because it is uh, a more modern uh, political concept than the Tsarist or uh, the Ant Ottoman empires at the same time. I think it offers a, a more interesting and, and, and relevant example of the interaction of ethnicity, self-determination, and, and football. We all know that after uh, 1867 and the creation of the uh, dual monarchy, Austria, Hungary, the tensions uh, continue to develop between Germans, Hungarians, and Slavs within the empire. National groupings uh, tended to overwhelm uh, the ideological parties uh, in, the federal, in the federal parliament in, uh, in Vienna. At the same time, the sporting world, and in particular the football world within the empire, began also to develop in a centrifugal uh, manner. That is to completely uh, escape the structures of the multinational empire and start to create uh, national uh, structures national structures which are, which are essential uh, to the history of football. It is impossible to understand the way football developed without understanding that it is nationally based and that the national associations are as much uh, attributes of sovereignty as a flag, uh, an anthem, or uh, in the 1950s, a national airline. So in 1901, the Czechs and the Hungarians create their own national football association. Now, mind you, they're still part of the empire, but they create their own uh, national football association. In 1904, it is the Austrians that do so. That is, the German speakers uh, within the empire. In 1907, the Slovaks. So we have, before the dissolution of the empire, already these nationalities developing their own uh, institutions, in particular in the field of sports and uh, especially in football, with their own uh, football uh, national associations. Interestingly enough, for example, the, the Slovenes don't do that. Uh, the Poles don't do it uh, because they are split, in the case of the, the Slovenes, between uh, the two parts of the dual monarchy. Uh, in the case of the Poles, because they are split between the three empires, 
uh, Germany, uh, Russia, and, uh, and Austria-Hungary. Interestingly enough also, there is no football national association for Austria-Hungary, only for its component parts. Just like there is no national football association for the United Kingdom. And already in the 19th century, you have an Irish, Scottish, a Welsh, and an English football association. So in many ways, we can identify the birth of the football national associations as being closely linked to the birth of a modern democratic uh, national movement uh, for uh, self-discrimination, uh, self, self-determination. But already, we noticed at that time, tensions that develop between uh, the different models of conceiving uh, sports and the impact of what I would call a kind of a national uh, straitjacket. And for example, the Austro-Hungarian authorities decided that this was not too healthy, the way football was actually identifying itself with the different ethnic group without identifying itself with the dual monarchy. So in 1897, there was an attempt to remedy the situation, and a challenge cup was created. It was the only way in which clubs from Vienna, Budapest, and Prague could play football together, because otherwise they would be playing in their own national leagues. That is, the leagues that were very much linked to uh, the ethnic groups in the empire. Now, the competition uh, did not have a great success. But in 1903, uh, something extremely strange uh, occurred, which in many ways illustrates uh, the very odd relationship between nationality uh, and football. The final of the German football championship opposed Leipzig and the club called DFC Prague. Now, Prague, of course, uh, did not uh, belong to Germany. Prague was still one of the main cities of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And therefore, we could expect either a team from Prague to play in the Czech League, which already existed, uh, or to play uh, with its uh, Viennese uh, counterpart. But instead, it played in the German championship. Now, the club was made up of German speakers. About a fifth of the population of Prague at that time was, uh, uh, were native German speakers, and uh, most of them uh, Jews. And there are very famous examples of uh, uh, the cultural impact uh, of uh, uh, Prague Jews on uh, German literature at that time. And people like uh, Franz Kafka or, or Max uh, uh, Brod. Now, half the team of uh, DFC Prague was actually uh, uh, Jewish. And at the same time, uh, in the empire, uh, the Jews that usually uh, represented a German-speaking element began to also develop their own football teams. There was also, uh, of course, the growth of, of Zionism uh, inside the empire. I mean, Herzl was, was a Viennese journalist, after all. Uh, and so you have Hakoa, which is a uh, Jewish football team in, in, in Vienna, and uh, uh, MTK in, uh, uh, in Budapest. And then later on, Austria-Vienna uh, would also be closely linked to, uh, to the Viennese uh, Jewish community. Now, 1918, uh, the empire breaks up, and then the national straitjacket gets much tighter. And, and we see after 1918, 1919, 1920, all the national associations in Central and Eastern Europe being created following the independence of all these new, all these new states. What is interesting is that suddenly we saw football before the breakup of the empire being part of that process. And in 1927, we see football being part of 
a certain amount of uh, uh, back trading. Uh, and the creation in 1927 of the Mitropa Cup, that is a football cup between clubs of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is, you know, quite odd. This is nine years after the breakup of that empire. And you remember, there were really no competitions within uh, the empire that brought teams from, from Prague, uh, Vienna, or Budapest together, apart from the failed attempt at the, at the Challenge Cup. Now, the Mitropa Cup was played before and after World War II. It grouped clubs from Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, Italy, uh, and, uh, and Yugoslavia. And the Mitropa Cup survived until 1990 and the breakup of Yugoslavia. There is a further breakup along ethnic lines uh, of a multinational uh, state. At the same time, and uh, uh, it is less well known, but uh, there was also a Latin Cup in the 40s and 50s. That is before the creation of the European competitions in the mid 50s. The Latin Cup with uh, most of the uh, Mediterranean countries on the European side, that is from, from uh, uh, the Iberian Peninsula to Turkey. Now, we shouldn't forget that in the 30s, uh, sports played also uh, a role, uh, not so much uh, in diplomacy as, as in, in warfare. And, and during the Spanish Civil War, there was a Basque uh, national football team that actually was advocating uh, uh, the Republic and played in many uh, European capitals. And just jumping uh, slightly ahead in the 1950s, the National Liberation Front of Algeria also created its own football team, which also played uh, practically all over the world. So there was a constant tension between uh, football as the expression of national sovereignty, very much tied to territory and, and boundaries, and the aspirations uh, to transcend nationality. And these aspirations, of course, led to uh, the European construction, but also were a kind of an interesting match with what was going on inside uh, the organized working class with uh, uh, proletarian internationalism, uh, both uh, of the communist and, and uh, social democratic kind. Now, the main uh, international institutions of football uh, FIFA for the world and, and UEFA for Europe were uh, created respectively in 1904 and, and for UEFA in 1954. And they've always been extremely ambivalent uh, about this relationship between uh, territory, national boundaries, and, and supranational states. Now, FIFA was, was there when the ethnic groups of the uh, Habsburg Empire were creating their own national associations. And FIFA actually recognized those national associations in the early years of the 20th century. But at the same time, it always put its emphasis on the national identity within recognized uh, borders and territory uh, of the football institutions. <coughs> So when the Rome Treaty was, was signed in 1958, there were a lot of ambivalent feelings uh, in the football community. Some people even feared that uh, the European community, as it was known at that time, would actually abolish the national teams. And I hear some of my colleagues, who are still uh, living perhaps a little bit in the past, expressing that fear almost on a daily basis. So there's no doubt that the, uh, the new institutions, the new European institutions, uh, were met uh, with cultural distrust by, by the football uh, institutions. There was a very strange cat and mouse game that was played in the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, between the European institutions and the footballing authorities. Uh, to quote uh, a rather uh, unfortunate uh, uh, phrase by 
uh, Senator Moynihan in, in the States, uh, which I find useful in this context. What was happening uh, between the European institutions and football was a situation that I would call benign neglect. That is, you exist, but we don't look at you. And that went on uh, until the mid-1990s. Football stuck to its idea, one country, one national association, which was basically the position it had in 1918, and Europe ignored football. And then came something that, if you're not interested in football, you probably have never heard of, but if you are interested in football, was probably the major institutional event uh, that occurred in the past uh, uh, 40 years. That is uh, the European Court of Justice uh, Bosman uh, ruling, which I can characterize easily because I've seen its impact on my colleagues as a traumatic experience for football. And why a traumatic experience for football? Because it stated very clearly that the free movement uh, of citizens uh, within the European Union obviously also applied to sports. Free movement of players, it meant for football. And it did revolutionize football. But there is a kind of false consciousness in the football institutions, both at FIFA and UEFA, to date, everything from Bosman. I think that what really changed football is that in the 1950s, clubs and national associations used to pay the TV networks in order to show the games on television. And by the 1990s, the clubs and the national associations were making millions selling the matches to uh, the broadcasters. But in our false consciousness, we identified the big change as the Bosman ruling and the free movement of players. So we developed our own internal contradictions with, on the one hand, national associations remaining, remained tied to boundaries and territory, and the clubs behaving more and more like multinational institutions. And in the middle, you had the national leagues, that is, the organizations that actually put together the national championships, kind of stuck between the clubs that were playing in them and the national boundaries in which they were confined. And I think this is the, the great contradiction that exists in, in today's football in its relationship with, uh, with Europe. It is the fact that you have the free movement of players, the clubs are increasingly multinational with foreign owners, foreign coaches, uh, foreign players. And then the existence, uh, survival of national associations and national teams. And the European Court of Justice has something to say about that because it recognized twice uh, the legitimacy of the organization of national teams, provided that playing for the national team remained an unpaid activity. That's something that many people in football don't know. But this is the, <coughs> the restriction. As long as playing for your national team is something you do out of your own goodwill, then it's fine. And you can discriminate on the basis of nationality and where the players were born and anything you want uh, for uh, the selection criteria. But if one day the national associations begin to pay <coughs> the players to play in the World Cup or to play in the Euro or in the friendlies, which some of them are beginning to do, I think we may have another legal conflict between football and the European uh, institution. Now, there is now a new treaty, Lisbon Treaty, 
which for the first time actually mentions sports. It's Article 165, which recognizes the specific nature of sports, what the sporting institutions call the autonomy of sports. And there is a strong ECJ jurisprudence, uh, more than 30 decisions that relate to sports. But as I said, the nature of football is changing. It is now an industry that generates billions of euros uh, every year. That is increasingly multinational in nature with club owners coming from the Middle East, from Russia, from the United States. And so the nature of the football model is changing. The nature of the relationship of football with ethnicity, identity, and nationality uh, is changing. And one may wonder whether we are not, uh, slowly but surely, moving towards what is the, the US model where uh, sports is basically an economic activity like uh, any other. It is something that the football institutions are strongly resisting today. But they are leaving this contradiction is a, in a rather uh, traumatic uh, fashion. And so are the football fans uh, all over Europe. Now, I hope I contributed uh, something to the cultural debate because I believe that uh, the sense of identity uh, that people still have uh, in Europe in spite of the changes in their daily life that are being conditioned uh, from outside the national territory of boundaries often expresses itself uh, in football because of its passionate uh, uh, context. And in many ways, one can look at football as a kind of a barometer of the feelings uh, of the people. And today, we see in football the enormous impact that immigration is having uh, in Europe, where in most local clubs today, uh, the bulk of the children that are playing football, just like it was in the early 20th century when migrants constituted uh, the bulk of the playing population, well, it is true uh, also today. So other cultural issues are emerging within the world of football between the mainstream culture and the culture uh, of minorities. And all that will have to be reconciled if uh, peace and an harmonious development can be uh, sustained uh, within the wider uh, European context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. William Gaillard. We'd be very happy to take questions or comments, which I'm sure you've uh, inspired with a very thoughtful and uh, inspiring lecture. I see the first one over here. As always, if you could stand and introduce yourself, it would be great. Hi, again. Um, I'm Chelsea Conan. I go to Luther College in Decorah, Iowa in the US. Um, I have a question about domestic issues. Could you say that um, football could be an outlet for solving some of the domestic issues in countries where funds lack for different types of, like you would say, football associations? My example here would be Colombia. Thank you. <laughs> you see, the European context is very different from the South American one. Um, in Europe, and in particular uh, in basically five or six countries, uh, football generates uh, an enormous amount of money. Uh, in, let's say the, the English Premier League, for example, uh, uh, has a turnover of about two billion euros a year. And if you 
add to it uh, Spain, Italy, uh, France, uh, uh, Germany, uh, Netherlands, and Turkey, uh, you are dealing with very large uh, resources. So there's no doubt that uh, in that context, uh, football can still play the role of a social integrator. And I mentioned the, the presence of minorities, and they are, uh, I think it was Vincent that, uh, or Daniel that mentioned it before, there are issues with racism in football. Because football uh, is a mirror of society. It, it is not worse than society, but it's not better. So the kind of conflicts that exist in society are mirrored uh, in football. Now, Colombia is, is a complicated case because uh, Colombian football does not generate uh, anywhere near the kind of income uh, that European football uh, uh, brings out. So th there's very little to redistribute in Colombia. I mean, the top Colombian players are all in Europe. Uh, so uh, I'm less optimistic uh, uh, in terms of the social impact uh, of sports in, in countries where actually sports doesn't generate uh, a large income. Uh, that, that's something that that's, we're going to have to deal with. Because Europe is to football what the US is to basketball. That is, Europe attracts all the best players from all over the world. Just last, like the US does the same thing is in basketball. Uh, and therefore, what's going to happen outside of Europe uh, is an interesting question. Uh, but certainly, if we look at football as a social integrator and also as a factor of peace, because in many ways uh, uh, teenagers today all over Europe uh, may be rooting for clubs that are not located within their national boundary. This is very, very common. It's a new phenomenon, but it's very common. Just like someone in New York may be uh, supporting the LA Dodgers, or uh, you have people in, uh, in Sweden who, uh, who root for Liverpool. Uh, or other clubs. <laughs> um, so uh, we have to be careful uh, in not extending an analysis beyond the, the European continent. Okay, please. Football and sport could integrate, but football could disintegrate. War, football war, in Latin America 30 years ago or so. Honduras, Salvador, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, final match in Brussels, Liverpool and, and Milan or in Juventus, Juventus. Juventus had close or more than 40 person being killed on the stadium. <coughs> I'm victimologist dealing with the victims. I have some knowledge about it. I'm very, these are dark side of the positive things as a sport. What's your position? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I said it before. Uh, football, because it is such a popular uh, activity, is a mirror of society. Uh, it's not better, it's not worse. But it's, it can be just as good or just as bad as society itself. Uh, what I tried to show uh, in, in my short lecture was uh, that actually, of course, football always played that role of integration, disintegration. I mean, football contributed to the disintegration of the dynastic empires uh, after World War I. It started even before the war, of course, as I, I think I showed. And then, after the war, I started to have a nostalgia for, uh, <laughs> for the things that were no longer there. Uh, I mean, you can have some uh, dangerous, what the Italian would call, irredentism. Uh, link to football. If you go around and look at the names of certain football clubs, you will understand that certain old conflicts are, are not over. Uh, I'll just give you one example. There's one of the top Greek clubs, who calls itself AEK, and the K stands for Constantinopolis, Istanbul. <coughs> so it talks back to the days of uh, the Asia Minor crisis of the 1920s and refugees from Izmir and so on. So, uh, so food, one has to be careful because sports has both qualities. 
It can bring people together, but it can also divide them. Yeah, sure, sure. But there, there you have a situation in which uh, something outside sports intervenes in sports. But, but the fact is, uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, one of the contributing factors was the riot in Zagreb. Uh, Boban. Uh, Boban. Boban, the, the Dinamo Zagreb uh, uh, Red Star Belgrade game. Yeah. And then you have people after that start to regret it. Uh, you know, uh, Robert Prozenitsky, who is a Croat today, coaches Red Star Belgrade. And he says, you know, in some ways we were happier before. Uh, so all these contradictions are there. Okay, there was another, actually now we have many questions, but I think uh, Ambassador Carl Eric, I think you were first. Hello, uh, Carl Eric Norman, uh, Secretary General of the European Cultural Parliament. I have two uh, qu uh, quick questions. Uh, one, yesterday uh, Mr. Touré, who is a, pl a player of uh, Manchester City, said he has a dilemma when he has to choose between the league, which is going on normally in winter, and the African Cup, where he is supposed to represent uh, the Ivory Coast. Is this a dilemma, or should it be a self-evident thing for a player to go back and play for his country? The second discussion, the second question, a little bit more tricky, perhaps, particularly for you as a French. Um, last week, uh, it was 1-1 one, one, a half time between Lyon and Zagreb. Uh, at the end of the match, it was 7-1. Uh, and of course, we are all very suspicious how this could happen. Is there anything in the structure of the, uh, of the Champions League that can be changed in order for us not to have to be suspicious in such connections? Thank you. Well, these are two very different questions. <laughs> I think the, the first one, you uh, answered it yourself. On the one hand, you can very well understand the professional interest of the players. On the other hand, it's obvious that the football institutions say, but your overall loyalty shall go to your national team. But he says, look, I'm also a professional. I have a job. They pay me. You don't. That's the, that's the big contradiction that exists today between clubs and national associations. That is not solved. Now, the second one is a much easier one. Uh, um, we monitor matches through partners that are the betting companies, including the private betting companies. And we know, usually, if matches are fixed, is because someone is trying to make some money and is usually linked to betting. There were no abnormal betting patterns that night. And I can remind you that uh, at the beginning of the season, Valencia beat Henk, the Belgian champion, 7-0. Things like that happen. The only way that we can make sure that we don't get too many of these very wide scores would be to restrict the access to the Champions League. And this is exactly what we don't want to do, because we want the Champions League to be as representative of European football uh, as it should be. And this year, among the last 16 teams that have uh, qualified for the knockout round, which will take place starting in February, for the first time, we have a Cypriot team, Apoel. Not only they participate, but they won their group. So they'll be seeded. <laughs> so things change also in football, even at the club level. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I'm not sure who is first, maybe on this side. You already asked a question, so we should have someone else. Let's go to the back, maybe, if we can. Thank you. Um, Ms. Garen, I very much enjoyed your speech. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I just want to pick out one point. Um, you describe football as a mirror of society. Um, there are some people that might question that. They may say that in terms of homophobia, racism, sexism, and violence. Football is actually considerably behind the rest of European society. How would you address an issue like that? Well, first of all, we cover a very large Europe. 
So Europe of 53 countries. So whether collectively on these issues we are behind, let's say, the European Union, uh, perhaps. Whether we are behind uh, the Europe of 53, uh, I doubt it. I think it mirrors the Europe of the silent majority, if I can use a, a term that I don't like, but uh, expresses rather well what I mean by that. That is, there is an elite Europe, uh, the one that believes in Europe, actually. And I mentioned before the conflict between uh, uh, the modernity of football and the postmodernity of Europe, between uh, uh, the masses on the one hand and, and, and the elite. So it's true, the European elite has uh, at least solved a lot of these uh, prejudices and problems that uh, you mentioned before. I think that uh, in the last decade, we have tried uh, our best at coping with those issues. I think we have coped well with the issue of racism. And because we attack the phenomena, I think society has made progress, especially uh, in, in the less uh, privileged uh, classes of society in Europe. I think the prejudice uh, is being rolled back thanks to the example of football. I think even in homophobia, where uh, certainly uh, outside the elite, it was a very common uh, feeling, of often expressed rather violently. Uh, the fact that football decided to tackle homophobia, the fact that in 2004 we suspended a national team coach because he made a homophobic statement, uh, it gave the idea to the bulk of the European population that certain things were no longer acceptable. Now, in terms of sexism, this is a, a, a tricky situation. Uh, women's football is, is developing, at least in some parts of Europe, uh, in the West and, uh, and in the North. Uh, more than elsewhere. Uh, the representation of women in the football uh, governing bodies uh, is still dismal. I launched personally an initiative uh, at the beginning of this year. We held a seminar with uh, non-governmental organizations and, and uh, advocacy groups in, in Amsterdam on the issue of institutional discrimination in football. Why are there so few uh, minority uh, coaches or women coaches? Why are there so few minority uh, leaders in our national associations or in our clubs? Why are there so few women in leadership positions in the same institutions? It was shocking for the uh, football community as we call it, the football family. But it led at least to one decision. We decided to appoint a woman to our executive committee as a result of the debate in that seminar. It had never occurred before. It was certainly a tiny step for humanity, but it was a huge step for football. I'm not proud of it, I'm just saying, you know, uh, we are pretty bad still. It's still very much a man's world. But at least we are ashamed of it now. <laughs> and even people who thought that, you know, what a crazy idea, do they think that perhaps next year uh, when the elections come up, we should reserve at least two seats out of 12 for women? Maybe three. But, you know, mentalities take time to evolve. Well, on that note, uh, I would like to ask everyone's assistance and please expressing our sincere gratitude to Mr. William Gaillard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>